In this video, we're going to define and describe heat capacity and specific heat capacity, what they are, go over some equations, and solve some real exam problems. Uh, this is geared towards a general chemistry or physics course, and I've got tons and tons of other videos on thermodynamics and other aspects of chemistry and stuff as well. Okay, so heat capacity is defined as the energy transferred as heat divided by the change in the temperature here. So in words, it's the amount of energy as heat required to raise the temperature by one degree. Now, we can do that using two main processes. One is under constant pressure. Now, under constant pressure, the energy transferred as heat equals the change in enthalpy. And I derived this in a previous video, uh, so you can check that out, or uh, let me know if you want me to do that in the comments. Uh, but this is true for constant pressure and assuming there's no other work other than expansive work, pressure volume work. If this is the case, then the specific or the heat capacity under constant pressure, that's what this P stands for, pressure is constant, equals the change in enthalpy divided by the change in temperature. And you can see on this simulation here, we have the pressures constant. And as we inject heat into it, it's driving the piston up and the system is getting hotter. It's absorbing energy as heat, but it's also performing work under constant pressure. Okay, next is constant volume. And using the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system, you've likely have seen this before, the change in internal energy equals the heat plus the work. Well, if there's constant volume, then the work is zero. Now we're assuming that there's pressure volume work only, so no electrical or other types of work. So the change in internal energy equals the energy transferred as heat. So our heat capacity under constant volume is equal to the change in internal energy divided by the temperature. So not the enthalpy, but the change in internal energy for constant volume. So you see here with the simulation here, as the heat goes up, the pressure goes up as well. The pressure is not constant, the volume is constant, and the energy being absorbed as heat is directly related to how this internal energy changes. So to compare the two, we have constant pressure versus constant volume. Constant pressure is done with most chemistry. So also with coffee cup calorimetry, you might've done this in the lab where you mix or react a few things together that's open to the atmosphere, that's key. And then measure the temperature change of the reactants as they go to the products. Or under constant volume, this is what we do in bomb calorimetry. Maybe you've done one of these labs that would be pretty cool if you did uh, but basically anything sealed in which the volume can't expand that's constant volume so if we look at the two between here we have constant pressure now with constant pressure calorimetry the gas can expand or whatever it is can expand and do work therefore all of the energy going in is heat it's not going into the internal energy some of it is going out as work so it takes more energy to heat the substance up under constant pressure than it does at constant volume because under constant volume the because the system can't expand the system can't do work it can't kind of offset some of that heat transfer into work by expanding because of that it's constrained into a vol into a set volume all of that heat transfer is going directly into the system which is directly affecting the internal energy and directly affecting the the C right here, change in internal energy. But the heat capacity of the pressure, uh, the system won't heat up as quickly uh, because as we have heat transfer into the system, some of that energy going in as heat can be can be lost as work. So it's not going to heat up as quickly, uh, essentially. So the heat capacity under constant pressure is always greater than the heat capacity at constant volume, or they may be very close to being the same, uh, but if, if anything's gonna be bigger, it's gonna be the heat capacity at constant pressure. At constant volume, that, as we just defined, is equal to the change in internal energy over the temperature. So because we have this extra term, and this is the work done, it's the negative of the work done uh, under constant pressure, we can see that the heat capacity at constant pressure is greater than the heat capacity at constant volume. Okay, great. So heat capacity C, capital C, depends on the amount of the substance. This is an extensive property. So it depends on the amount. For example, 
Lakes are colder than ponds. Uh, lakes are comprised of a bigger body of water. There's more water in a lake than a pond. So on any given day, if it's a hot day out there, the lake can, can absorb more of that energy as heat if it's hot outside and they won't cool or they won't heat up as, as quickly as a smaller pond will. But specific heat capacity, specific heat capacity depends on the type of substance. So not how much there is, but the type of substance. So it's intensive. It's with, it depends on the type. So for example, the heat capacity of a lake is equal to the heat capacity, sorry, the specific heat capacity of a lake is equal to the specific heat capacity of a pond, which is equal to the specific heat capacity of water because they're all just made of water, okay? Assuming just there's just water in there. And that has a defined value of 4.186 joules per gram Kelvin. The specific heat capacity is equal to the total heat capacity of that substance, say the total heat capacity of the lake or the pond, divided by the mass. So when you divide out the mass, then the specific heat capacity of that substance uh, should be the same. And you'll probably be given a table of, of specific heat capacities. So here's uh, just a few right here. This is specific heat capacity for some of the values. Notice how water is, is very high. Uh, copper is very low. That means copper is a good conductor of heat, of energy as heat. So it doesn't take long to heat up copper or to trans, uh, transfer heat throughout copper. But water is not a good heat conductor. It's a good insulator because it heats up slowly, for instance, because it has a high specific heat capacity or a specific heat. Okay, so our main equation for looking at heat transfer and how much energy, uh, how, what the temperature change is if we give it so much energy as heat into a substance is this one. And I call this the MCAT equation because it kind of looks like that on the right-hand side. Q is the heat, energy transferred is heat. M, of course, is the mass, often in grams, heat's often in joules. Uh, C is our specific heat capacity that we saw, which is in joules per gram degree Celsius or joules per gram Kelvin, whichever. And then, of course, uh, temperature is the temperature change, T final minus T initial. But what's cool is that we can put in degrees Celsius or Kelvin into the temperature because we're looking at the change and a change in degrees Celsius is the same as a change in Kelvin. Okay, so for our first problem here, we want to know how much energy is required to heat a 125 gram block of aluminum from 25 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna use this equation here, how much energy is required to heat it. So that's our Q, so Q equals MC delta T. M is our mass, 125 grams. And C is the heat capacity of aluminum. Now, if we go back to the table, aluminum has a heat capacity of 0 0.89 uh, joules per gram degrees Celsius. And the change in temperature is final minus initial. So we're going to 85 degrees Celsius. And uh, our initial temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. Now this could be per Kelvin, but even if there's a Kelvin here, it'll count, cancel with these degrees Celsius because this is a change. Okay, we'll plug this into our calculator. And we have 125 times 0 0.89 times bracket uh, 85 minus 25, oh, which is just 60. But okay, uh, 6675. So 6,675 joules is required. Now, if your prof is a stickler for sig figs, then we really only have two sig figs because of the heat capacity. So this would be 6,700 joules. Okay, awesome possum. So we'll go to the next one. Uh, last question, what is the final temperature? So we wanna know something else of 100 grams of water initially at 15 degrees Celsius if it re receives uh, 15 kilojoules of energy as heat. So this is our Q, this 15 kilojoules. And we want to be in joules because specific heat is usually in, in joules. So we're gonna convert this to joules first to, before we plug it in. So this will be, uh, 15 kilojoules and the conversion is there's a thousand joules for every one kilojoule. Okie dokie. So the mass is a hundred 
0.0 grams of water. The specific heat of water, again, we need to look at a table. And on my table, it says 4.19. You might have more decimal places, 4.186 or something like that. Uh, but we'll just use this one for now. Uh, gram degree Celsius could be degree Kelvin, um, but that's okay. Uh, times the change in temperature. Now we want the final temperature, so we're just going to leave it as TF minus the initial temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, and our kilojoules cancel out, our grams cancel out, so that's fun. And this degree Celsius, oh, it doesn't cancel, it's, it's actually going to be additive, so I better keep that in there. Okay, so the left-hand side uh, is 15,000. I don't even need to do that. <laughs> Let's divide by 100. Let's do 15,000 divided by 100. Oh, don't even need to do that one. Move 150. Uh, so we'll have 150 on the left, 150, and that's with joules. And we want to divide by this number as well. Divided by 4.19 joules. Oh, not joules. Uh, yes, that's right. Joules per degree Celsius. And that equals T final minus 15 degrees Celsius. So that if we solve for T final, I'll just kind of do it over here. T final equals this. Uh, let's, let's calculate it. 150 divided by 4.19. 35.799. So 35.799. 35.799. Now, joules cancel out, and we're left with 1 over degree Celsius, but this is in the denominator. So if we kiss and flip, it becomes the degree Celsius. We'll move this to the other side, so it'll be plus 15 degrees Celsius. Let me know if this is confusing or not. I, I hope it's not. Uh, I'm not trying to be. I just kind of moved this over and did this at the same time. So that's 45, so 50. So it'd be 50.799 degrees Celsius. It's the final temperature to how many sig figs? This only has two sig figs, unfortunately. So then this would be two sig, uh, we only have two sig figs. Okay, so it's 51, 51 degrees Celsius, which is fine. We only have two sig figs for the initial temperature as well. So it's the same precision. Right on everyone. Well, I hope that was very helpful in understanding what heat capacity is, uh, what the equations are, the difference between constant pressure heat capacity, a constant volume heat capacity, and thanks for watching. Uh, check out my other videos. I got so many others on thermodynamics and also in other aspects of chemistry and physics and math. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. <music>